Hi everyone, thanks for joining. Today I'm speaking with Faisal al Mutar. Faisal is recently become an American citizen. He was a refugee from Iraq. He grew up under Saddam. And now he's one of the or he's the founder of Ideas Beyond Borders, which is an organization that translates books on science and philosophy into Arabic, Kurdish, and Farsi. Hope I'm not missing anything. And they're also starting to translate Wikipedia into Arabic because there is a woeful lack of internet sites in Arabic. Faisal, thank you very much for coming on. It's great to talk to you. Thank you for having me. Great to be here. To be back, yeah. So, okay, um, I'm sure a lot of people know most of your background, but if you can give a little bit of that and how you started IBB, and then if we can go from there. Sure. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I was I was born in Iraq uh, just right after the first Gulf War in 1991. Um, so I grew up my first uh, half of my childhood in Saddam Hussein, and the neighborhood. So I was born in Babylon, Iraq, but I was raised in Baghdad, uh, the capital. And my neighborhood was many of them were were uh, some of Saddam Hussein's generals uh, or the people who were in the military. Uh, the reason is that relevant is, is what I'm going to tell after. And so after the war happened in 2003, uh, which I'm sure many of you have heard of is uh, many of these people sold their houses and or not necessarily sold but kind of became empty and then many of extremists start taking over so from a usual residential neighborhood uh, that it became a war zone uh, that many of the people who were living there uh, were of particular terrorist group which is al-qaeda um, so right after the war there was maybe a year of peace and then afterward, many of these militias start moving. So my neighborhood, which is which is in, in, in the west part of the country, became pretty much a war zone between them and, and the other militias, um, and also the U.S. Army and the Iraqi Army, which was being developed um, there. So whatever people saw in the news from uh, war was kind of the daily reality of me and many people who were growing there. Until today, unfortunately, so nothing much has changed on, on that level. So, um, so yeah, um, as a, so my neighborhood and my uh, high school have been pretty much attacked multiple times. In fact, it was attacked on the first week I attended high school. Um, and so my crazy me at the time, um, and to get a bit about my background, at least on, on a religious way, I mean, I grew up in a... And it's kind of a secular household uh, in which I was pretty much taught critical thinking. When I was young, I was allowed to choose if I wanted to be a Muslim or not. I was allowed to think um, in comparison to other religions. And my neighborhood was actually kind of diverse religiously back at the day. And there were a lot of Christian, Yazidi, and other sects living there. Um, so my crazy me started writing and blogging and organizing around some of the secular beliefs, because I believe that was the only way to really combat sectarian violence, um, mm -hmm. that kind of have a, an inclusive government, uh, for the lack of a word, of, of people of multiple sects, or, and really separation between sectarianism and state. Um, so that's how, how I started kind of the, into that world. And um, long story short, um, one of the, my colleagues at um, my high school, um, his his cousin was a member of these mountain groups, and my name ended up on death list. So I, uh, uh, the group came into my high school, um, and then I had a, a death letter uh, with a bullet um, saying that if you keep doing it, you will whack you, technically. Um, and it was at the time in which they were constantly targeting people, and, and so it was definitely a, a serious threat, not just a a joke on the internet, and then uh, I had to change schools. Uh, I moved to a I uh, went to a different school, a different neighborhood, which was kind of safer. Um, and then the moment I was able to finish high school, I took my bags and ran away from the country. Um, I moved to Lebanon first, um, where I was supposed to apply to move to the UK. Uh, that didn't work out. My visa was rejected three times. Uh, for multiple reasons, mainly is, is 
I mean, I just I fit the profile. I'm a young male, um, and uh, also one of the main reason was money, uh, really, is that they wanted, uh, as far as I remember, sixty thousand pounds in my savings account, like fifty fifty thousand pounds, sorry, which is equivalent to a sixty thousand US dollars. And you're talking about an eighteen-year-old <laughs> from Baghdad. I mean, I don't have one. I don't have sixty thousand dollars today, and I've been living in America for six years. So, uh, did, did, my, did I collect enough bakshish? Yeah, uh, exactly. So, um, so that happened. So, and then I so I got accepted in a. So at the time I was accepted in a British university, and then um, because of the rejections, I was not able to attend that. So then one of the people at the admissions was. Kind of sympathetic, and he was like, "Oh, there's, we have a similar education program and systems in Malaysia, and I've looked at that there are people, of you, like people of your passport, uh, can go there without without rejection. So how about I move your admission to 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 there, and I can forward them your details and everything." And he did, and I got accepted in Malaysia in a university called Sunway University, which teaches British education system. And then I applied for refugee status in Malaysia in 2010, and then I got accepted to come to the United States in 2013. Uh, so that's when I moved to the West. Um, and then I start working. First, I moved to resulted in Houston, and then in Texas, and then I moved to DC, and then or I started working in the more the nonprofit world um, on a kind of higher level in terms of organizations and. I worked in this project started by Google, um, Google Ideas, which is kind of the so social section of, of the technology company, uh, which was, they funded it, they funded it first, they, they gave it a grant. And I worked there for four years, which was about helping activists in the Middle East. And then I started my organization, Ideas Beyond Borders, which is, you mentioned. So that's kind of my story uh, until I now live in New York and, and operate this organization. Yeah, okay, first of all, I gotta say, like, Ideas Beyond Borders, um, you know, I think I said this to you before, I, I, I think this is absolutely the best initiative I've seen, um, you know, to actually do some real good. Because, I mean, I know there's people who do counter extremism and that kind of stuff. Uh, and people talk about fighting bad ideas with good ideas. But that's what you're doing, and you're trying to fight extremism by getting people to stop doing it. Like, you know, like before they even become an extremist, you're trying to stop it there, right? Exactly. So that's that's the mission. So it's the mission is preventing extremism before it takes root. So actually dealing with, with the kind of the ecosystem and the environment that allows these stuff to flourish. And thank you for your support. I mean, you've been a great ally since uh, we started this organization. So so thank you. Yeah, no, like I said, I, I think this is fantastic. Um, now, because... Especially with what's going on now, um, like I know you're working with a couple of universities out in Iraq, and you're working with students and stuff, and your translators and all that. You know, some of them are in the region, or I don't know if most of them are in the region. I mean, if you want to talk about like what they're doing, like you know, the, some of their difficulties and stuff like that. You know, especially now, like okay, now there's active like war zones all over there again, so. Um, Sure. So, so, um, so the so I can explain the translational program. So we have so our major programs is called the Beit Al Hikma 2.0, which is named after the House of Wisdom, which is this as a symbol of the enlightenment uh, of in, in the in kind of giving it a historical context. Um, so the so the program is 2.0 is kind of make Arabia great again, but but also make uh, the the Muslim world great again. Is that is the symbol of of, of inquiry and, and especially science and, and uh, open-minded and all of that. So the, the program is divided into two factions, actually three factions. The number one faction are people who are specified in translating books. So this is where uh, we have done the works of Stephen Pinker from Enlightenment Now. These are kind of like major works. These are projects that take about sometimes 11 months, uh, 13 months of translating, editing, proofreading, formatting, all of that. Because in one, like in terms of books, you have to get it right and once, and then you get, uh, you, and you release it. And it's released in our library website as a PDF that people can download for free. Uh, with that, there is another component of video creation. So 
we create summary videos of these books that people who probably don't have that time read or because of internet connectivity or lack of access. An easy video of four minutes can explain most of the books or at least the summary of it and the main topics. So there's this element of the translation. The second element are the Wikipedia translators and also the articles translators. These are people who are more between part-time and full-time. Uh, there are about 100 people. There are 100, sometimes some people unfortunately have to quit because of security reasons and, and, and all of that, and they, they, they could not continue um, associating with an organization overseas because of, of many accusation of, of betrayal and, and all of that. Uh, so 100 are the ones who work with us right now. Um, not most of them, actually all of them live in the region. Oh, so uh, the, all of the 100, uh, they live across the Middle East and also North Africa. There are some, so uh, Iraq, uh, Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, that's where kind of was of the concentration of, of freelance kind of full-time, part-time uh, translators work for. And then, so we started with that first. And then uh, we got an interesting offer from uh, an advisory board member of ours. Um, his, his name is Omar Muhammad. He used to be a historian in Mosul. Um, at the time, it was the, the kind of the second capital of ISIS. And he was the one who... He had a very famous blog called Mosul Eye that used to uh, capture what the life under ISIS was like and he used to report it to New York Times and BBC and so he used to like live around Mosul and take pictures and send it uh, into journalists to cover what life under there. So he became um, also a target of extremists but he also been in touch with the university. So so that is where the third faction comes in. So he couldn't, he was able to connect us with the Department of Translation at the University of Mosul. Um, long story short, after communication, after back and forth, they said, okay, we're going to do it. So we started our first one at, the, at Mosul. So like, and that was like literally a few months after ISIS was, <laughs> was defeated. Um, so we started there in like June 2019. And after that, the word spread out in which more universities wanted to join. And now we expand it to six other universities. And the program there is, is, is mainly student focused, that is uh, getting these translators who work in the Department of Translation, students in the Department of Translation, to empower their skills and to get them to be able to tra be translators for, um, and also be introduced to other forms of translation. So there are some people who are, uh, say, specified in translating humanities, but then when they work with other people who translate science, they actually be able to learn about kind of their skills. Um, so in each university, we have 10 students per semester. So that is, is gonna add up about roughly 70 students uh, every semester. And we're hopefully, by the end of March, hopefully we're gonna end up in 10 universities. So that's 100 students per semester. Um, and the goal is to have actually an annual conference in Iraq, um, end of this year, to actually bring all the students together. And and, and there's a possibility that Steve Pinker might be actually to do a webinar um, or kind of an online talk. Uh, maybe as we release it, we'll get more people, definitely will be not, uh, notified. And um, So that is kind of the three factions. We have the books, we have the freelance translators for Wikipedia, and then we have the university program. University program. Um, the programs that got impacted the most, uh, you, you mentioned by war, so, so, so one of the biggest issues I mean, security is like number one. We actually have to deal with two securities. We have physical security and digital security, um, which I, you offered um, multiple times to help us with, which is something definitely uh, constant. So the, the, the physical security is, um, is, uh, is a constant issue for us uh, for multiple reasons. It, it's either, it's coming from two people, it's coming from the states, uh, and it's coming from militia is more than the states in some in some because uh, it's much less disorganized than and it's really hard to predict um, and we also have issues like as a US organization we're not able to to transfer money to many of these war zones so in a way we have to figure out ways that uh, that are legal um, to be able for us to be able to even operate um, in, in, in or work in, in people who live in in these areas um, so 
how does it look like like that in practice? Is is uh, is once in a while I get a I got a phone call that that one of our translators had his house blown up, <laughs> and uh, he's not able to do a translation, and uh, um, uh, or like a, a translator get threatened by a neighbor or sometimes a friend, um, and um, also the general security of the whole nation because of of conflict. So that's that's one, and, and the digital one is. Sometimes some of the websites and uh, get blocked in many of these states. Um, so um, fortunately, many of the younger populations are very aware of of uh, VPNs and some of these technologies that allow them to circumvent some of the censorship tools. Um, but it's definitely an ongoing issue as these countries. I mean, Turkey, as of I think ten days ago, used to have a two-year ban on Wikipedia. So Wikipedia was banned in Turkey, actually. Um, for two years, and now it's finally back. So the people who are, who have like some Syrian refugees who work with us as translators who live in Turkey were not able to access Wikipedia. So they had to kind of, we need to help them and kind of sending them the article without them having the access to the website. And that was kind of also a logistical difficulty. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's an ongoing, um, it, for us, these geopolitical and, and regional dynamics have a, a great effect on our work. Um, um, on daily on daily basis. Okay, like you know, you're not even thirty yet, and it's, it's kind of embarrassing because like everything you accomplished that that young. But well, but, I mean, I'm double aged because I lived in, in multiple wars, so you can say yeah. I'm plus ten. Yeah. <laughs> but I've already reached thirty. Yeah, but I, I mean, like, if you go back and look at the Middle East, yeah. and if you read anything about it, and if you kind of actually study the region. Secularism was a poison term, right? Because secularism to them, I mean, it, it was the Shah, it was Saddam, it was, you know, the Assads, it was Gaddafi, it was enforced, right? So even if they didn't want religious secularism, the term itself, like, is there, is there or at least that's what it seems like to me to like when I'm reading this stuff, but is there a change in attitudes now? Or like, are they accepting it or are they speaking of it in another way, they're still not calling it secularism, or what are they trying to do? Well, it depends on country by country basis, but I think I think there is, so, I mean, here's my understanding of history, at least from, from and also understanding of, of, of many terms, at least in the region, is that, so, I mean, pre-World War I, we used to have the Ottoman Empire, it pretty much controlled most of the, of the Arab world, and, and um, and they, they used to be the dominant force, and they used to be in constant warfare actually with the with the Persian Empire. And Baghdad was actually shifting between the Persians and the Ottomans uh, quite frequently. And then after World War One, there was a rise of two movements that really have dominated the middle Arab landscape. Uh, the Arab first one is the Arab nationalists, and these are the people like Jamal Abdel Nasser and and Saddam Hussein came in later, and so as Hafez al Assad and and to some extent, these they are not. They are I wouldn't like have used secularism, but they have never really talked about secularism. They have been always kind of playing the ball, um, and, and in many cases, actually used religion. And they were religious. For example, like Saddam Hussein, the the, the version that I grew up with was actually uh, he's the one who put Allahu Akbar on the Iraqi flag. Mm-hmm. He's the one who declared that Iraq is a part of an Islamic state, and our duties as Iraqis to actually liberate Palestine and, and kind of uh, create an, a new Islamic empire. And in the same way for actually Assad, and, and also same with Gaddafi and, and, and people you mentioned, is that as a, some of them have started with Arab nationalistic tendencies, and that's kind of how they were able to, to consolidate power. But then as time is surprising, they, they were using religious language at least. Or maybe even believing in it um, uh, once in a while, and then and then the the second wave was the Muslim Brotherhood. So that's kind of the Islamic Islamist movements. Uh, these are the people who um, believe in a theocracy and or necessarily like believe in creating an Islamic state. In, in some occasions, uh, violently, and some not. But so these are kind of the two dominant uh, waves that really took over the the, the Arab world. Um, None of them have been particularly 
at least in identity wise, uh, have used the term secular. They never identified themselves as secular. They've always identified themselves as Arab nationalists. So um, there is a lot of negative connotation uh, to Arab nationalism. Um, it, it's it's mostly coming from Islamists, really, but but it's also coming from more of the younger generation who really rejected that whole notion of that Arabs are. And Arab nationalism is defined differently by different people. Um, some some can be can view it as superiority of other races, and some say because Muhammad came from us, we are kind of the the people of the message. But um, but I think it's. And some of that took, some of that took secular, kind, not necessarily secular, but kind of more Marxist uh, tools of like, of of even some of the languages that that were used were really heavily influenced by uh, socialist uh, tendencies coming from the Soviet Union and, and coming from other kind of socialist uh, um, thought. So, so most of the parties, for example, Ba'ath parties, is called the Hizb al-Ba'ath al-Arab al-Ishtiraki, which is the party of the Arab. Socialist, uh, yeah, party. So, so all of the Gaddafi is the Islamic Socialist Arab Liberation Party. So, all of them were Arab Socialist, and, and in some cases Islamic in their name. Um, so they were. Uh, so, in terms of, of kind of so that, that kind of the the the, the, the that is what I would say. Well, there is most of the negative connotation, especially among young people. As for the terminology, I mean, in, in terms of of, of there's been a lot of, of, of people who uh, use the term in Medinia, which means civil um, civil state, which is, it, it, it just means the civil liberties. Those are the people who advocate for civil liberties for people. They're not necessarily interested in, this, in, the, in the political governance of how the government should be, but they're interested in kind of spreading civil liberties. Um, and... So, and, and, and that's where like kind of the Mujtama al-Madani, which is kind of civil society um, world. Um, so, it's actually, in fact, is, is, uh, there is a, a verifiable claim. Um, so, Wikipedia has a tool in which you can see what are the most viewed articles in whatever language. And if you look, if you put it in our, our list, which is the articles we have translated, secularism is actually the most read article we have translated one of the top 10. Oh, okay. Sorry, I think it's the fifth in which it has, I think, 600,000 views. And the same with, uh, there was a, also Darwin, and Darwinism and evolution is actually also um, on the top. So so, so the demand for um, an alternative narrative to both the first Arab nationalism one and second, the Islamist one, is actually pretty much on the rise uh, across the Arab world, which is supported also by the a new research uh, done by um, an organization called the Arab Barometer, um, and which was contracted by the BBC. I don't know if you have. When you, there was multiple articles that talked about like many of the Arab youth are, are yeah. losing religion, but also at the same time adhering to more kind of secular liberal attitudes. Um, so that kind of a larger scale. So yes, yeah, so, so I think it's like mainly that the word secular is. Is is not does not have much negative connotation as 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 like calling yourself a Baathist uh, or calling yourself an Arab nationalist. Um, that these these attitudes have really the attitudes toward Arab nationalism and, and kind of the socialist Arab nationalism is not is not having its best days. I would say. Yeah, something that you'd mentioned there because a lot of people, again, and I, I I probably fall in this. You know, they'll, they'll start talking and they don't really do 100%. But, you know, like what's going on in um, in Syria right now? Everyone's like, oh, Putin this, Russia is there, the Russian influence. Syria and Libya were allies with the Soviet Union. You know, after, I mean, like the, the Iranian Revolution was communists and the Ayatollahs. And then finally the Ayatollahs consolidated power and kicked the communists out, you know, and made it all religious. But, you know, so the Soviet Union was kind of like could deal with Iran a little bit because they didn't care about world sanctions. So, you know, like people don't realize that. I mean, like that whole region, like, you know, they'll talk about American imperialism and whatever. You can talk going to all that if you want. But I mean, there was also the Russian in the wall, the Soviet back then. And now it is also Russian. Like there, like South Yemen was communist. Like I have never understood that communist Islam 
um, like alliance. It just never made sense to me. Yes, as, as, I mean, just like many other regions in, in, in the world, the, the Middle East was really affected by the Cold War. I mean, there was there was a Cold War happening in the Middle East, and there were states that were, and, and I mean, many occasions were on the side of the Soviet Union. I mean, except the Gulf states um, that were supported and, and, and installed installed by the British, really. But um, so yes, I mean, many of these. Uh, um, Many of the, uh, unfortunately, many of the commentators of the Middle East really uh, just look at the Middle East just recently. I mean, many people who, who, who probably start commenting about Iraq really didn't know much about Iraq until 2003. Or, um, so they, they think that the history starts like in 2003, not really that this is one of the places in which there were um, hundreds of conflicts that happened over uh, hundreds of years. And it's not just... Um, and, and we are, we're saying it like even until today, which like many people would like the kind of the simplistic um, solutions to, to many of the issues there, and and, and, and our even simplistic uh, explanation. And I think it's a it's a pretty ignoramus of ignorant of many of the people um, to kind of link it to to one issue or another. Okay, like what's going on right now in Iraq, though, right? Because I mean, especially because you. Know, Trump almost started World War Three, apparently. Um, but, you know, and then some of this information came. You had Iranian forces in the north. There's, like, also, like, I think the Kurdish area. I mean, there was Americans in the south. Um, there also, like, Ir there was... Iran was playing games with the Shia, like, you know, trying to help Shias in Iraq. Like, and everyone's just, you know, no one knows what's going on in there. And it's still like, okay, well... Oh, the, the the Iranian parliament just voted, or Iraqi parliament just voted to ask the U.S. to leave. It's like okay, but let's take a look at that. Like, was it you know was that pushed by Iran, or was that how how did that happen? Like, I, mean, I, I can unpack this uh, mm -hmm. kind of uh, try to do it in, in a quick as way possible. Mm -hmm. um, so actually, that goes back to my kind of time there because it's very relevant. So back in 2007, there was a movement called Awakening Forces. Uh, these are people that were of Sunni background that were uh, work with the United States government, and, and at the time it was David Petraeus, and also at the same time, Rocket Army to defeat Al Qaeda, and, and and they have done a tremendous success in actually doing that. The Iraqi election happened, and then there was a guy called Al Maliki, who was uh, a Shia uh, sectarian uh, guy affiliated with Iran, um, called the Dawah Party. Where is he from? So one of the things that 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 uh, he was pushing for is really discrimination against Sunnis and, and cutting the salaries and 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 all of that of the Sunni militants, so, so, so anti Al Qaeda Sunni militants. So as a result, he created a lot of back. Uh, so that have antagonized most of the Sunni areas, mainly in the western and northern northern Iraq, below Kurdistan, northern Iraq as in Arab northern Iraq. And uh, then, as a result of that, of I mean, obviously there are multiple reasons, but one of the main reasons why that allowed a vacuum for ISIS to 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 exist, and the pullout was actually also an element of that. So then, as a result of that, after him antagonizing the Sunnis and really killing many of them, um, he Iran come in and tried to save the Shias from the Sunnis. So in a way, that they are the ones who were advocating for killing all of those who were fighting Al-Qaeda, and then they were like, oh, let me help you fighting ISIS. So then that's how the Iranians were actually, Iranian army was actually, or the Quds Force really, was getting involved more and more in Iraqi affairs and kind of the, 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 the quote-unquote, the fight against ISIS, which was actually, most of it is, is in my opinion, was motivated by sectarian um, uh, drive. So then... After that happened, so everybody was obviously focused on ISIS. It was the biggest issue. Then that war ended. Uh, that war against ISIS ended, and, and and ISIS was defeated. Then many of the Iraqis were like, okay, so now ISIS is gone. So what's what to do next? I still don't have a job. There's no electricity. There's no job. There is. Um, so then, other than trying to to solve the issue and actually trying to 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 help the youth, the the, the Iranian uh, supported government and as well as the Iranian militias, they start killing people. 
rather than them actually trying to address their concerns. So the borders first started not that big, and then they start killing people more and more um, to suppress most of these voices who who are like saying that 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 it's that what to do now now that you are executed. So whatever whatever the time was like, there was a protest to ask for better electricity. Many people were like, oh, but no, but we're fighting ISIS. We cannot do it. So even though the, there is no interconnected, but 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 uh, they tried to use that as justification all the time. And after that was gone, um, many of the youth are like, okay, so now that's gone. So what's so what's your excuse now? So other than like giving any new excuse, they start killing people. So the the main drive for 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 the protests is really make basic human rights that they're asking for uh, not being killed okay. uh, having a job and good economy and and for them to to and then because of the constant um iranian influence that that and the fact that this iranian influence is now killing many of the iraqis and killing many of the protesters then the protests are turning into kind of stopping the iranian influence so I like the the the, uh, the many of the kind of the Western analysts who started seeing talking about Iraq just after Soleimani was killed. They didn't know there was a constant warfare actually happening or between actually the, the, the many of the protesters and and, and, the, and that explains some of the videos of people actually celebrating in the streets after the killing of Soleimani because he was him and his militias were responsible for. Killing many of the Iraqi protesters. So that that's a, that is a, a, a one explanation of, of how things turned out. Um, and it, the, the protest is still happening. In fact, the more they kill, the more there are more um, people protesting because it's uh, it's getting unbearable. It's a constant. Um, yeah, there's what ten just killed recently. Well, no, not 10. I mean, I mean, the total so far is 600. No, I'm um, talking like just in the last two days. I think there was yeah, like 10 yeah. killed and 130 it, injured or something like that. Yes, and, and, and they're using live bullets and, and mm. they um, um, a lot, and they're targeting a lot of journalists. So anytime a journalist criticizes Iran, the Iranian militias kill her inside Iraq. Mm. Um, so it, it's a constant. So many of the protesters are really demanding full independence away from Iran. They don't want... Like, so, so the way people talk about ending the U.S. occupation, but many people are also sick and tired of the Iranian occupation. Uh, but that is not the ones that really get much of the coverage. Um, yeah, yeah. They, they, they want to talk about the austere Muslim scholar. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, because, because that is, I think, one of the things, one of the issues, I mean, we, we do face <clears throat> is, is that many of the, uh, I mean, so unfortunately, yeah, not many, but, but, but a significant amount enough is that it, it's a, most of their views are pretty American-centric views. They they ignore most of what's happening in the region. Everybody who's who's really uh, in conflict, and then they they just look at it as is America good? Is America bad? Who is the good guys? Who is the bad guys? And it's a it's, it's immensely simplistic. Um, and yes, I mean, for example, the Iraqi government that kind of made the, the thing about the. I mean, number one, it was this thing was not legally binding. So actually. Most of the coverage was was false because it was just kind of an uh, something that, that that was pushed for by a pro-Iranian government by a pro-Iranian party, and it the, the, both the Sunnis and the Kurds were actually missing in the vote. So yeah. it was a, it was a pretty uh, sectarian, uh, uh, and, and and there were people like reporting on it that it was the Iraqi parliament, but it was but, but they forgot to mention that. That almost more than a third of the country and of people of other sects actually didn't vote or were in there. Um, so, so it, it is uh, pretty sad to, to to kind of see that that in a way like 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 it's it, it's not helping that that all of that coverage is not really much helping the people over there. It's pretty no, I, uh, I mean, okay, like just putting you know like I, putting a rock. For just aside for a second, like right, right when that happened, the stuff in Iran, like you know, Nancy Pelosi goes on all the, the the Sunday morning news shows, and won't condemn. Oh well, you know they were cheering for his funeral, and look all how many people went to his funeral. He was loved there, and it's like, what are you talking about? 
And then okay. well, that's one side, yeah. Okay, but you know, but majority of the people who also went there, I, I, I don't want to say majority, but a lot of people who went there were forced to go there. Oh, you work for the government. If you don't go, you're not going to get paid. You're going to get fired or whatever, right? Um, but then there was also um, like th- there's you know it was Trump's fault that that plane was killed down. All the all the deaths are on Trump's head. All the blood's on his hands. And then anyone anyone killed in the protests. That's also Trump's fault. So, like, people who are asking that, I put out a legitimate, like, whatever. I put out a little tweet, and I said, here's a hypothetical. If all this is Trump's fault, like, the plane being shot down and all those people killed are Trump's fault, and all the protesters being killed uh, due to the protest because of the plane being shot down are Trump's fault, if these protests succeed and they bring the regime down, are you going to give Trump credit for bringing the regime down? I mean, if it's yeah. all his fault, if he's responsible for all of it, like, you know, this is not a defensive Cheeto man here, but if it's all his fault, then if something good comes out of it, he's responsible for that too. Are you going to give him credit? Well, it, I mean, that is the issue, I think, is, is, it's, a, a, is that when, when domestic, uh, domestic and, of, and political differences um, start really triumph over what the facts are and, and really what's what's really important is people on other either side of the aisle really scoring points uh, against the other party and really um and not just the case of nice pelosi it's just that it's happening with a lot of different uh, people from both sides and i think is that this is a an issue that really affects those of us who really work on the ground than trying to change the situation because and actually I mean one of the reasons that, that I started the organization and I think it's a very driver main driver um, and I was offered jobs in other places is that I didn't want the Middle East or at least those of us those who, who support the values that, that, that we, we do to be really uh, only dependent on all of the US domestic warfare uh, between the parties of like, a, uh, I mean, let's assume the Democrats are on our side, and if they lose, then the Republicans are not, or vice versa. And and I didn't want to put the future of the region, especially the future of those who really adhere to values of the Enlightenment, to be really tied into all that bullshit. I mean, I've been living in the United States for, for now six years, and I really don't read the news much about what's happening here. I, I really don't, and I really don't care that much. But... But, and, and I think is that it's it's uh, not because I don't care about America. I love America. It's just that I I'm really tired of a lot of infighting constantly happening in the Congress, and and I I don't think that any of that any conversation happening there um, is really having a lot of effect on really changing and supporting the people on the ground who are who are really putting their lives on the line to fight for uh, these values. So I think it's like one of the um, drive for 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 IVB is really like if, and and it's kind of like a, it, it, in what is what a shocker to some of the people we work with is that many of them like don't believe that we exist. It's like are you really kidding me? Like there is an organization that supports secular thought and enlightenment stuff. And at the beginning it's like there were people like spreading rumors and stuff. Well, oh, like these guys are the U.S. government and. And stuff like that, and I was like, "Oh, I wish it's the U.S. government." <laughs> but trust me, they would have they would have saved me a lot of uh, time and the job. It, it's it's not. So like, they were actually really shocked, that, like that there actually there is an out there organization uh, from the outside world that that is really helping them. Which is is that most of that discussion and and, and clusterfuck and the fighting um, has provided zero help over the past maybe 20, 30 years. To actually any of the people there, and most of the people here are just trying to score political points to be like, okay, I'm I'm doing this, I'm doing that, and stuff like that. And it's sad. It's just, it's just a sad state of affairs um, because it's it's the people who are believing these ideals over there are really our biggest assets, and they're the the people that uh, we should stand in constant solidarity with, um, even emotionally, if that means anything. Okay. Getting back like that exact point, right? um, you don't hear about that. You don't hear, you know, about those kind of movements. Like even like you know whatever. I, I don't want to get into whole fake news BS because there's a lot of that garbage. 
but okay there is um we, we talked about it a little earlier that uh, i don't know if they were volunteers who worked for ibb or if they're just people in general who were going out and handing out free copies of pinker's book because they wanted to spread the message of enlightenment now right so they're just printing it up and going out and handing it out now you don't hear about things like that and there was another thing that happened end of last year in morocco um and i keep bringing this up there it was a charity there were two women from belgium who were working for this charity they decided to wear shorts one day because it was morocco and it was hot um some professor at a university said they should be killed so they got the girls out you know safety that's important all the press could focus on was this asshat. All the press could focus on was this guy who wanted to call it for the death. Look at this. And it was left and right. Like It was like, like, oh, the right's pushing this narrative, whatever. They maybe put one or two words in each article about, oh, and there was a bunch of protests around Morocco where the citizens didn't, weren't having any of it, and they were wearing shorts to the beach and this and that. It's like, that was the bigger story. The citizens don't want it anymore. Like, focus on... The people in the Middle East, the young people in the Middle East, who are fighting for the values that I see a lot of people here just saying, we don't need these anymore. Or, you know, like what's going on with the protesters in Hong Kong? They're, they're holding up the Union Jack, they're holding up the American flag, because that's what they want. Yes, yeah, so, so, I mean, I mean, I don't think it's an issue of fake news. I think it's an issue of... Uh, okay, sorry, uh, I just, I, I, I shouldn't have said fake news. I don't think it's fake news, it's selling a narrative. It's more yes, than anything it, else. It's, uh, and, and that is a, I mean, it's, it's going on, uh, well, actually, to give you an, an, another um, story, I mean, I mean, for for example, I mean, I, I'm constant in, in touch with, with, with many of the translators, and one of, one of them that deeply moved me um, was a guy, his name is Amin, Amin Jalili, very, very amazing guy, and when ISIS was taken over, he downloaded all of Wikipedia, he actually had a file, the whole file, and was giving it to his students when ISIS was actually in power. He was giving it to his students, kind of keeping them knowledgeable and educated, all of that. And I was like, and the guy like, speaks English, and, and he actually wrote about it publicly before and stuff. Uh, and I was like, of all the news about ISIS, I mean, there was 50 million articles about ISIS, and rightly so. I mean, there are terrorist groups that need to be covered, and, and for people to know about them. But there was no mention of people who are like, really... Like this guy was actually giving John Stewart mail to people under ISIS. <laughs> like, like this is, was a punishable offense, like by death. Yeah. And there's and there's the countless people like him, and and people talk about counter narrative. I mean, there's no better narrative to, to show that many people there are really fighting the good fight. Um, and eventually, like a friend of mine at the Guardian was able to actually get get to, it was like. Are you kidding me? Your article has not been published, and there's like 50 million articles about ISIS, and this guy cannot get a quote. And finally, he did. <laughs> um, so, I mean, there is a new project. This I think started by a new American foundation uh, that is focused on really creating and 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 and, and spreading these positive, um, not necessarily positive messages, but really, I mean, they're facts. And I think is that. In order for you to understand any situation, you have to look at the facts on the ground. That includes the negative stuff that happened and the positive stuff that happened. And, and try to um, push a certain narrative um, that um, is, is, is what for a lot of our political agenda is, 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 is very dangerous. I mean, it's not just on international affairs, but really on, on I mean, on domestic side. It's like there is... Um, I mean, Latin now is actually great. I mean, the whole counter, the whole thesis of Latin now is, is is that the world is getting better, um, and here are the facts that 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 actually prove that. But he mentioned is that how many times that these facts about how much medical research and how much scientific uh, development we've had over the past years that allowed lower cancer rates, that allowed life span to expand, that allowed all of that. Compare that. To the news of like, or somebody was shot. You look, go to the news, whatever it's, it's, it's local news, and all, all you hear is like somebody was shot, the other person get kidnapped, the other person. I was like, you look at that, it's like the world is falling apart. It's like shit. Like like, 
Like the moment you just the, I mean, the, you just like read the news on a day, and really all you hear is the world is falling apart, pretty much. And this narrative is, is actually in a way it fuels the extremists because if the world is falling apart, then they need to be saviors from that happening. And that's where the, the, the extremists come in. It's like, also you, you have this immigrants uh, killing or raping women, and obviously they single out five, six cases. Oh, here, my party X, I'm a far-right party, we're going to kick them out, uh, or, or etc. Or look at the white supremacists doing this stuff, me, far-left party, who are going to save you from that in the world. So, and for most Islamic extremists, they, they also use the, the world as falling apart. And we're, so in the ways that indirectly, this kind of constant negative news is, I think is really impacting like psychologically how we feel, see the world, but also really having a lot of political, because when the world is falling apart, somebody's going to save it. And generally that people, that somebody's going to save it. It's going to be, the supremacist of some sort, or extremist of some sort, yeah. because he believes that that we're, well, that's it. Like the world is really being destroyed, and brings it back is that, like, how many? So, so on the Enlightenment Now subject, you said the printing. Number one, it was people there reaching out to me. So, so I didn't actually know it was happening. It was people saying, "Hi, I saw this. Like, is is this Peter Heckman your your project?" I'm like, "Yes, it is," and stuff like that. And they were like, oh, are we allowed to print the book? And this is like somebody I didn't know on Facebook. He was actually on the message request. So, so I, I was in like someone that I, that I personally knew. And, and I was like, oh, so there is like a demand over there. There was like people who was like, yes, like I saw many people uh, like were talking about secularism and, and stuff like that. And, and I see everyone else is just giving people other things, like, but I don't see the secular thing being represented. So, so it's like, do you mind if I print it? And I was like, not only I, 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 I don't mind. Let me give you some money so I can print more. <laughs> so actually, so so in that way, the the the, the people were printing it, and, and and it was volunteers. It was people who were on the protest. Um, and then we, I mean, we printed the first wave. It was 500 copies, and then they were done. And then we had to print another thousand one. Um, and and even though the book is big, we, we did is that we printed the first seven chapters, and then we put a QR code for people, or they can go to our website to actually finish reading the book. But so what it means is that, I mean, that that, that about story that didn't get much of media coverage. I mean, thank God for social media. Um, is that the fact that Pinkers is known and 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 I am known to some extent, but but is that I was able to tweet about this that. That that kind of story went viral on Twitter, um, but otherwise, like no one would actually know that this existed at all, um, and 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 that's a story. Like that's that's in a way it's just, that's like no, it's, you it's, don't think it's, it's huge. Oh. Okay, like, but I think there's two blind spots in the media. Sorry, to me, like. Like a story like what you're talking about, what your organization is doing, or like you know, young people yearning to get information about civil liberties and basic human rights, like that should be focused on. But then when they cover Muslims here, or like, I, I, again, I think these are these are two cases. One is really horrific, and the other one is just like, was bad and was a missed opportunity. The horrific one is, you know, like now police departments and social workers in the UK are coming under fire for like letting, you know, 20, 15 to 20,000 girls get raped over the last 10 to 15 years, right? Or maybe even 20 years, you know, because they didn't want to, they didn't want to be racist and go after South Asian men. And so, you know, they just, they let it happen. So, and like no one covered it. People went to the media, like it, it didn't come out. That's a huge media failure because they wanted to push a narrative. And the other one was that girl in Brooklyn a couple of years back. Her, you know, she said her hijab was taken off, and she filed a police report. It turned out to be a hoax. Now, when she went to court, she showed up in court with a shaved head. No one took the opportunity, and I don't want to, you know, use her as a prop or whatever. But you could have the discussion then of, a, why did she falsify it? What was she so worried about? And look at the punishment because her father found out she lost her hijab. 
You know, like, I mean, this is like nowhere near the level of those girls being raped, but you had the opportunity to talk about what the hijab actually is instead of having it as the symbol of the women's march, you know? And in England, because they didn't want to talk about, they didn't want to seem racist, no one covered, you know, like 15 to 20,000 girls being raped by Pakistani men just because, eh, they're poor, you know, white working class girls, who cares? Well, yeah, that, that's that's what, what I think is, it's, um, I mean, when, when I, I mean, other than the, the IBB, there was a, a project I started long time ago called the Global Secular Humanist Movement that now is called Global Conversations. And, and one of the reasons why this started is that knowing that there was no or almost zero coverage of many of the things that not I was doing, but also other people are doing, I was like, now that this social media thing is a great opportunity uh, for, for me to reach the people. And it is used very well like now, I mean, it's kind of interesting because there, there, like in the Middle East, in many other countries, like we work in, the media is controlled by the state. So in a way, like you cannot even write, like in many cases, you cannot even write for for the media. It's not, it's not as, uh, so as, in a way that social media has been really used effectively uh, in really getting this news out there. And it seems like in, in, in the West, like even though there is the free media, but at the same time, um, is there are all these? I mean, ma- many of the media is politicized, and and, and each one is um, is really trying to push whatever narrative that this media belongs to. Um, so that's that's a. It really brings up the need that 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 if you have an idea, I mean, you're, you're definitely doing it. I'm, I'm, is that like other than waiting for um, being uh, invited into um, I don't know, uh, Anderson Cooper, or, or, or is that you are able to now have your own podcast, interview people, highlight voices that you like, mm-hmm. uh, because otherwise, I'm sure many of the people you highlighted, maybe some of them have never really got the ability to have their, to have their quote at the, at, at CNN or Fox or, or, uh, because they don't, like they, they, they're, they're in a way, they're the peasants. No one really cares about them. They, they're not part of a larger narrative that that people want to push. So, so I think I think there is a great opportunity now in this kind of new media and alternative media to really um, tell this the, the the stories that that the mainstream media or, or, or I mean I, I sometimes I'm worried of using the term mainstream media because it's it's also a highly misused term, but it's it's um, and it's funny, except that some of the people who criticize mainstream media are themselves mainstream. So, no. so I was like, who? Uh, but but I think it's like it, it's it's there is definitely truth in 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 that in that this now kind of new media is really um, changing the, the the landscape of of how. I mean, also like I mean, even even about about Iraq and also like protest is that I mean there is kind of sort of free press in Iraq and there are like some newspapers, but even them are very politicized. So I, I, I get more of my news about what the protests are from people on Facebook than I do on on the news. Because of course, whatever news is also owned by a political party or, or not political party and try to wish a specific narrative. And, and uh, yes, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue globally. And, and I don't, I'm, I'm I'm also worried that now there's kind of a wave of, of, of censorship on social media that might actually limit um, that that kind of positive views, and, and, and then we end up with, stuck with the negative as well. Um, yeah, I, okay, but I mean, all the censorship and stuff, I, I, I keep hearing it, and I keep hearing it, and oh, oh we really got to do something about these kind of comments. Oh, yeah, we have to make sure that no one sees this. And it's, you know, like... To stop the guy from speaking, that's bad enough. But then you deciding who gets to listen to what, who gets to read what. I mean, that's that that's the worst part of the censorship, right? Like the, the free speech argument, that's the bigger argument. The argument for the right of the listener. The speaker is important, but you need that listener. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, and if you, uh, and getting, yeah. It's, it's definitely a, uh, I mean, I, 
Because in a way, it's like how, how to stop. There's there's an argument um, on the other side of like how to stop the extremists from from um, using such platforms to spread their ideology. And there is the the counter argument is also used in a very positive direction. I mean, I spoke recently at uh, at a conference a few months ago. It's called UCAT, which is the unintended consequences of technology. And there were people on quote unquote both sides, and and and, and IBB was featured as kind of a positive example of, of how social media is used and and my goal is actually take to take this um, and I think you're, you're an example of positive consequences of technology like you're using it to actually create social good and, and highlighting people um, so I think it's like we also have to get our voice prevalent over all of the ne- constant negative stuff about against social media is that it's kind of this place in which uh, allowed ISIS to grow and to allowed um, like all of the other stuff. And I think it's like I think is is our voices in that way in this subject really matter because we we are using social media for good um, and, and and we are allowing people to hear different perspectives and not be stuck into whatever a grander uh, narrative is is wants to push. Well, here, maybe I can uh, set a challenge to, you know, some of the university students out there and maybe some of your translators. So have you read, I'm, I'm assuming you've read Areopagitica, Milton's, uh, like it was basically a speech he gave to Parliament um, about uh, free speech. Have you ever read that? Oh, I've heard of it, yes. I, I, I think Hitchens once mentioned it in one of his speeches. Uh, Hitchens mentioned it quite a bit, yeah. So <laughs> yeah. it was, Milton wrote a speech, gave it to Parliament, put it out as a pamphlet, um, and this was the defense of free speech for publication about 150 or so years ago, like after the the printing press had come out, like 100, 150, like I have to look up the dates. Um, And all the arguments that he put out, if you read those arguments and you hear some of the stuff they're saying about the internet, oh, the prevalence of information, blah, 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 he counters them all. So maybe get like some of your uh, the students who are working with you or you know, in those programs okay. or, and, 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 and make it Areopagitica 2.0. This is, you know, um, these are the like, this is why these rights are still valid for the Internet. And just get them. How to pronounce that? Sorry about uh, Areopagitica. It's um, it's it was, it was a hill in Athens where like kind of like public uh, speaker's corner in uh, in London, right, where people just go say, I don't know if it was that crazy, but. It was a place for oratory and for free expression, and it was a hill in Athens, and so he named his book after that. Interesting. Yeah. I, I would I would love to see if, if it's if it's actually is available in Arabic or not because that's I mean um, in Arabic. Okay, I found it. So I I will be. I hope I hope to see it translated. Yeah. You know, okay. Here like, we go. The, the the Arabic Wikipedia of it is like one paragraph. So. <laughs> I know, I mean, yeah, the, the the book is fantastic. I mean, I kind of go back and forth as if which which I think is the better book for uh, the defense of free speech, that or on liberty. And it's kind of you know it's, but it's I, I but like I said, it would just be I've always joked that we need an Areopagitica 2.0 now because you know all this stuff about censoring the internet. And if you read that book, all those arguments he tackles, and they're still valid. I think it's it's a. Uh... It's like we need one for the digital age. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, get okay, get a translator first of all. That'd be awesome. And at the same time, we're saying, okay, well, why don't you explain why why this is also good for the digital age? And have you know, like, like I'm worried about this. Like, if if we stop here in, in North America or the West, the like the the you know Western liberal democracies, if we stop supporting this stuff, who will? Like, who's going to champion it? The Chinese, um, you know, Putin. <laughs> You know, Modi with uh, Hindu Tva, like like someone's got to keep this up. Someone's got to keep this alive. That, I mean, definitely. I mean, I mean the um, um, interesting. You mentioned that is that I think it was Erdogan um, in Turkey, and he was there was a conversation about after the coup d'état, but uh, and he was like arresting journalists and, and, and all of that, and and he mentioned well, in the West they censor journalists. So why why do you why am I being single got single dot over here? So in a way, he used the the fact that there were journalists censored in the West as, as obviously he will always find a justification. Yeah. But um, I think is that um, there are people like there has to be 
countries that will stand uh, for these values that, that they would be kind of a resemblance of enlightenment values in a practice. Otherwise, for for us is is uh, it's kind of really interesting because because it's like for the people I I work with and I work for uh, in, in the region is like for them like they would die to have free speech they would die to have free internet but it's uh, sad to see some of that being reversed it's like people here um, and I think some of it is just have to do with is that you appreciate things that you don't have more than the the, the, the things you have and. Um, and the people can 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 uh, um, spit on on whatever liberty they have because they don't know uh, the alternative, and at least many of them have not lived an alternative. Um, and um, and I think it's like I mean there are some organizations I mean um, are kind of doing some work in kind of highlighting people who lived in the authoritarianism. One of them is a partner organization called Human Rights Foundation. They do. Um, some work in which bringing people like from North Korea, from China, from Venezuela to come actually give speeches here in New York and and uh, like actually how to live in the real authoritarianism and 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 and, and how did all of that authoritarianism start um, happening? That it, it was gradual in some cases and it was a takeover in some others. But what I think is that if nobody stands for these values, who will? Um, and that's really their call for the West. Is like, like stand for freedom, stand for, um, stand for liberty, because it's uh, where we come from. This is a, uh, um, I mean, in some cases, it's, it's uh, um, very. Uh, I mean, in, when the internet, when 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 the Iranian protest you mentioned happening, I mean, the the government shut down the internet for days. Mm -hmm. So in a way, that even people who um, lived in, like, had relatives overseas, they were not able to contact them to even tell anything. Um, so imagine imagine here the internet being shut down for half an hour, and I think people will be, uh, will be pretty freaked out. Are you kidding you me, man? You, you can't get on Instagram for half an hour, it'd be riots. <laughs> uh, there will be uh, definitely riots. Um, but I, I think it's, 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 uh, um, something that definitely needs to be defended uh, here and abroad. Um, it's hard to do both at the same time because I think for me, like just working in the Middle East is more than enough. Like many people say, why don't you expand to other places? I'm like, I think dealing with Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon is good for a lifetime. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Man. Like, no, no, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying you specifically, but I just, you know, I thought, okay, if they could translate that book, I mean, the book was. It's, it's, no, it should, no, it should be public actually, domain. I, I just put it. I just put mm -hmm. it to. Uh, I mean, I mean, th these are materials. I mean, all liberty. You mentioned all mm -hmm. liberty. It was. Uh, it's one of one of the other books that was printed and distributed by professors. They were not. Was not something that mm -hmm. that IBB helped on, but 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 it was something that people were, because these are these are these are books that really have or, or pieces of content really that that have changed minds and, and they're used and they have a symbolic value into them. Um, you know, Liberty is, is I mean, I'm, it's, it is one of my favorite books. It's, it's like, it, there is a, like, the, and, and in a way, it's like some of the, there were many people who were kind of made comparison about how enlightenment rose in the West and is that in a way it was rising in the middle of sectarian violence as well. It's like there was a lot of war between the, Catholics and the Protestants and, and, and kind of these enlightenment thinkers were rising in the middle of it. And I think there is kind of something happening in the Middle East is that all of that warfare between the Sunnis and the Shias and, and kind of many of the militias over there is really creating the enlightenment 2.0 uh, in which people are, in which the materials that were created in the first enlightenment, in, or not the first enlightenment, but the enlightenment that John Stuart Mill champion are as relevant to, to is an actual way in, in terms of time frame. It's like it's he lived in sect, there was sectarian violence. They lived in sectarian violence. There's a lot of, like all of this material, even though they were written kind of long time ago, they are very relevant to many of the audiences there, um, and that that includes all all of that, whether Rousseau or, or Voltaire, or, um, and kind of all of the main figures of the people, and of course Mill. Um, of the figures we think of as the 
figures of the Enlightenment who, who uh, yeah, created much, but now most men people call Western civilization. It, it's, it's really relevant to that people there. But okay, the the Enlightenment thing. The, not, I mean, if you want to translate it, I think it would be awesome. But uh, there's a, a physicist, uh, David Deutsch. He also oh. does uh, he also does philosophy. But he wrote this amazing book called uh, The Beginning of Infinity. That is actually translated. It's translated not by us, but it's, it's we are distributing that book. It's okay. Sort of... That, but in that book, he talks about pockets of enlightenment that have happened in the past, right? So you had, and each one got slightly better because they refined on the ideas from the one previous. So they all took it from each other. And I'm hoping that you know, 500 years from now or a thousand years from now, there's not a future David Deutsch. That writes about us as another pocket of enlightenment. That I, I, I repurpose a Dawkins quote, and I say, "Oh, it's good to have an open society, but not so open that you let your first principles fall out of it." Mm-hmm. And it seems like that's what we're doing. We're, we're tolerating ourselves to death. We're tolerating ourselves to an authoritarian system. I mean, I, I, I do. I mean, I, I think is that it's definitely the the internet in a way has an accelerating factor. Um, I mean, many people say the Middle East might take 300 years for it to reach enlightenment, but it actually could possibly take less because of of, of technology. But, but I think it's like, I mean, that is kind of the um, uh, the Karl Proper argument also is, is kind of the, the, the tolerance of intolerance. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, and in a way, freedom can be also self-defeating. And, and, and then freedom of speech allows people who say freedom of speech sucks to speak. <laughs> While people who, 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 if, if people who believe in freedom of speech sucks, control, they don't allow people who say freedom of speech is good to, to, to speak, say it. So, there is, so that's kind of like an interesting, um, not, not necessarily a weakness, but, the, but it's just an essential piece of freedom. That, like, I mean, um, Nazis, communists, um, jihadists uh, flourish sometimes in open societies. But people who advocate for open societies will be killed under these regimes if they actually have control. And, and, and it's really, um, it's a contradiction that, that's, uh, and, and the way it's like, I mean, for us, this is a conversation, but also, like, uh, I mean, I, I just came back from Europe. I spent about a month, I uh, was invited by the, by now it's the former Ministry of, Educa- of Education of Denmark. And I spent about two weeks in Denmark and, and, and about a week in Oslo. Um, and before I was, I went to that's after actually I saw you in Montreal. That was mm-hmm. that was the, the week after that I, I flew to Europe. And this is these are the questions they're actually struggling with as we speak. And and and, and they in some cases they they make decisions that are could be interpreted as extreme or, and or not because I mean these these ideas we're talking about tolerance and intolerance and is. Um, is really now when you are moving them to a law, um, and there is it, it becomes really a policy. Um, it becomes really difficult uh, because, on one hand, some people like on the subject of immigration, some people say we have to be tolerant to our people who lived in war. Some people say well, we have to be tolerant, but those who believe in extremist ideals cannot come, and those who say we should not allow immigrants in the first place because we cannot accept we're a small country, and so like. In a way, like all of these subjects are having like and 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 contradictions in a way are, are um, constant reality. In many countries of in Europe and, in, and constant realities in many countries in the, in, in the world, not not just in Europe, but 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 it's uh, it's uh, we have to strike the balance and we're not to and and um, but I think I think one of my friend is like. Before you try everything, anything, try freedom first. Yeah. And see if you if you don't like it, maybe switch somewhere else. But yeah. but start freedom first, and yeah. then, then and then yeah. pick 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 the other pick if if then then you can because if you start with the others, they will let you have the other option. So you're kind of stuck stuck with them. But at least try f- freedom, and then if it didn't work out, go to the other option. Yeah. Uh, because that's, that's, once you give it up, you're it's, it's you're gonna have to fight to get it back. I mean, it's, exactly. Um, but I, but I'm, I'm, I'm talking about like in a way is like what what keeps me going in a way is that um, I'm 
I'm very happy to see like many people of um, of not to say our background, but people like from from um, Middle East and Southeast Asia and stuff um, more today than before. Um, like now, as we speak in 2020, who believe in these ideas and and are fighting for them. Like, and I think I think that is really um, great. I, I think I think it's it's, it's uh, because when when, we, when I first started kind of in this blogosphere and and, and um, that was 2005, so it's been a long time ago. It's been 15 years, but it's like there were only like few pages that were like secular or, or scientific and stuff in Arabic. There were like very few, and now there are like tons. There there are dozens. Um, one of our follow one of our allies have 3.5 million followers, and the page is about science in Arabic. So it's like what it says is that despite. Um, all of the negative news, there is actually um, a lot of hope, and I think these people are um, doing great work. So so we have no choice but to defend for our freedom here and fight for them there. Well, I think on that note, um, you know, I don't want to take up too much of your time because I could like, sit here and talk with you for hours, but it's a, it's a positive note to end on. And again, I, mean, I can't stress enough how great I think what you guys are doing and like, you know, hats off to all your translators and everyone's working there because, I mean, they are they are actually putting themselves at risk. You know, you know, like uh, they are not in a safe space. Anyway, no, man, no, they aren't. Um, and, and and I mean, also, I mean, you made a video for them, and I also say is like, so, and that one is like, if, if if one of your audience or listening, will, um, I mean, one of the main things that like, people say like, how can I support these people and stuff like that. Yes, money is one, but many of these times of these people are not motivated by money, and 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 they really need emotional, like seeing the people out there care about them is really important. Um, and for anyone listening, a recording of a two-minute video or three-minute video that they can email to, info at ideas beyond borders will be great because kind of this constant um, emotional support. I mean, many of these people um, actually live. And and their constant war, they have rockets flying over their houses. Um, the, so, in a way, like I mean, they have every reason to be depressed, but they are fighting back. And 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 sometimes what they need is really uh, a hello, and and there is somebody out there who knows about their story um, and cares about them. So if anybody is listening and and feels just a quick two minutes and three minutes video um, that thanks these people that that thinks that that is thankful that these people even exist uh, can send it my way or IPB's way and, and I will happily uh, send it to them um, I mean your video was actually seen by all of them and they were like amazingly happy well, uh, just good, it, it just meant yeah it means something is that oh they're like oh like my people know about me like because many of them don't live in a Talk about safe space. I mean, they live in a closed space. They, they, like, they live in, 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 they are very sheltered from, I mean, the only thing they have to the world is the internet. They're really sheltered from really um, most of the people outside their limited zone. So uh, seeing that people out there care about them and, and, and think, think that they're uh, great will be of great benefit. Yeah, well, thank you. Um... If you want to let people know where they can get a hold of you and any links or anything that you want, just send me. Like, I'll put the links for IBB and all that in there. But if there's anything else, just let me know. And I'll put sure, it in the I mean, description. Um, um, I think, I think the, the most, I think, I think an email info at Ideas Beyond Borders will be great for people who are interested in, in giving the video. Um, I'm actually doing much less speaking uh, this year um, because I, I for, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to spend as much time on. On getting this project uh, done as possible, but uh, I will be around. I'll definitely, there is, uh, I'm definitely in, in America most of the time. So if people want to catch me. America is a small country, so they will see me. They will see me somewhere. Yeah, the rise of the shawarma caliphate. <laughs> that, that's the goal. Well, thanks a lot again, and thank you everyone for listening. We'll be back.